It's quickfixgolf.com once again, together with all our friends, talking golf, talking different things that we can do to help our golf games. And it's myself here, Bobby Lopez, along with your favorite, the one and only Darren DeMaley. <laughs> and we are the PGA pros in Tupelo Bay. Hey, hey. <laughs> if you don't know Darren, Darren um, worked for Nicholas for seven years, but he's also some other famous people he worked with as far as Druga, Martin Hall, Michael Breed. Uh, he knows his stuff. He's really good. Um, I was lucky enough to happen to teach a tour and pro when he was winning the U.S. Open, so senior open. So that's my claim to fame, of which I don't know that I did very much, but whatever it was, it worked out good. And I've been taught by a lot of the Wild Bill Melhorn all the way to Henry Cotton to, I mean, a lot of big old names. That must Did you teach any dinosaurs, Bobby? Were there any dinosaurs that you taught? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the one that's with the Flintstone. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about tonight is wedges, and I think um, considering today's golf, I would say the driver is the most important thing you're going to buy. The putter is the second most important thing you're going to buy. The wedges are the third most important thing you're going to buy. Everybody else ties for fourth. You see that, Darren? That's, that's, that's uh, spot on, and that's what I say all the time. Those three clubs are so vital to the game, and uh, everything else can is fourth. You're right. Manolo Pinedo, a guy I used to room with a lot on the European Tour years ago. He, in fact, he beat Lanny Watkins in the Ryder Cup. Um, Manolo always swore that we shouldn't have 14 clubs in the rules. It should only be 12. You should only be allowed one wedge, and you should have to manipulate that wedge. That shows the talents you have. So you shouldn't. It's not fair to carry three or four wedges. So um, that's that's um, it's the old way. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree, and I think, but one of the most interesting interesting things that we've come across. And all these webinars that we've done uh, about equipment and whatnot was um, the gentleman from South Carolina, uh, the coach, what was his name, Bill? Um, Bill McDonald. Bill McDonald. When he talked about limiting T height, I, th I think that was so interesting. You know, we talked about wedges and drivers and how many wedges you can carry. I think limiting T height was such a um, off the cuff type of thought that uh, it would affect how many wedges we need. We we need less wedges if we could tee it up only at a certain height. And and so simple, but you know, right on target. I'm telling you, what's a heck yeah, of a thing? Right. It's so simple. You say, why didn't I think of that? You know, just tee the ball up, Lord. Now, that to tell you one thing: if you're not teeing the ball up high enough, you're not hitting the ball far enough. Going the other direction. So, what we're going to do is sort of pseudo uh, go through the purchase. We're going shopping. Here we are at the Callaway site. And of course, Darren and I are both going to tell you it's great to look at the Callaway site, but then you need to talk to us about getting fitted properly. When you're going to do so much, so much of your fitting online, uh, would you agree with that, Darren? I mean, Callaway might get mad at us, but that's the way it goes. No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, they're there to support us. We're there to support them. I think it works both ways. But yeah, you need to get the right wedge. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go look up my golf clubs and what set of clubs I have because I want to know what the loft is on the pitching wedge. So let's just say we bought the latest and the greatest, so we have the Maverick irons. Then I'm going to come up here and look at specs. And then I want to know what wedges I'm going to have that are part of the set. Now, I have very little respect <laughs> for wedges in a set because the way I look at it, it's an engineer that builds the set of golf clubs. There's nothing wrong with that, but he's in front of a computer and he makes the five iron and the six iron and the seven iron and, you know, and a little bit of differences between each one, a little more loft, a little more this, a little more that, a little more offset. Then you get to the wedges and now he's out of his territory because guys like Roger Cleveland do nothing but think about wedges all day long and then they go to happy hour at five o'clock. They're dealing with touring pros who to come out like Phil Mickelson and they say, look, you know, grind a little more off of here, take a little more off the heel, a little more off the toe. They're, they're, you know, they're getting into the real minutia of building the best possible wedge they can build. That is not the wedge that belongs with the, as part of the set. So I would say the sand wedge is gone for sure. I'm not going to use the sand wedge at a regular set. And I'm not going to use this gap wedge at 51 degrees either. Darren says yes, right? Is that what you said earlier today? 
Yeah, I was, I was saying that earlier. I'll give you another good story we didn't talk about earlier. That Nicholas went to, he went played up in the treetops in Michigan. And he did an uh, exhibition with Phil Mickelson. And Jack's pitching wedge, mind you know, we, he's kept his, he's kept the same loss throughout his entire career. He hasn't changed once. You get- know, the modern day loft is so different. So he was playing the, the treetops and um, Phil Mickelson hit a shot and Jack was like, okay, this is an exhibition, mind you. What, what club was that? And Phil's like, oh, that was a pitching wedge. And uh, Jack hit his seven iron. And, uh, you know, uh, l- long enough story that they were pretty much the same lofts, right? Because Jack had a pitching wedge that was 50 degrees. Think about that. That's the old standard for a pitching wedge. And now here we look at this chart. That's a gap wedge. The pitching wedge is at 41 degrees. But um, it's, it's, it's changed over the years, the standards. I think, well, I don't think I know. Ping Ping is probably the company that has kept the most standards throughout all the years. But, you know, nowadays those those lofts are, it's it's not really, a pitching wedge is really not 41 degrees. That That's an 8R, something along those lines. It's But, but you know, the thing is they, they, they've changed the ball rotation and, and the, the ball coming off the face to where they can get it, what they call the wind. Uh, so even though it's an 8R loft. Um, you know, the, the new fast pace, what they call the, what is it, artificial intelligence that they develop these new clubs. It's actually developed by a computer. So, well, anyway. Right. As far as yep. concerned, I wouldn't go past the A wedge. As far as, I go. as far as I'm concerned, the A wedge here, this approach wedge is the pitching wedge. The pitching wedge is a nine iron. The nine iron is an eight iron. The eight iron is a seven iron. The seven iron is a six iron, and so on, in my mind. Not that there's much to put in my mind, but that's that's about what fits. Right there. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I put it. So so then I know, okay, I'm at 46 degrees. So now I'm going to go back and look for my wedge. Okay, so this is where you get in the discussion with Bob Vokey and Roger Cleveland. And, right. um, you know, whoever else you want to talk about that specifically designs wedges. They're designing wedges differently than they would in iron. Okay, so let's forget pitching wedge. Let's say a pitching wedge is a 10 iron, okay? Just, just for argument's sake, let's say it's a 10 iron. The 10 iron is going to be completely different than the 11 iron or, or the sandwich. They're designed completely differently, specifically with the length of the hosel. The um, Most golf clubs, the hosels are a lot shorter for irons, and then the sand wedges are a lot longer with their hosel. And when you have a longer hosel, you can move the weight around quite a bit, which is going to affect the, um, the ball flight, and it's also going to affect um, – how easy it is to hit. It's going to be a lot harder for you to hit that sweet spot with a, a golf club with a long hosel. If that makes any sense. I, you know, I never thought I never thought of it that way. I know you were brought that up this afternoon. It's an interesting point of the longer neck on the wedge. But you know, when, when you've grown up with it all your life, I guess you don't. You know, it doesn't. You just don't pay attention to it. And, and and we're talking, too, about things that you can measure nowadays, Bobby. You know, as opposed to when you were playing, it was more of a feel. It was more of a um, a visual. Nowadays, there's no doubt that if you go from a 50-degree pitching wedge or gap wedge to a 55-degree sand wedge, short hosel versus long hosel, there's a big difference in there, just not 10 yards. It's more than that. Well, and I agree with that. In other words, if, if we took this gap wedge at 51 degrees and we go look for a wedge now, it's 51 degrees or something like that, somewhere close to that. That wedge that we're going to choose is not going to go as far as this gap wedge. Because the gap wedge is going to have a little offset to it. It's going to have a lower center. Correct. It's going to shoot yep. in the air, so it's going to go further. But, you know, that you know Bob Vokey wants to sell wedges, and he does a great job designing them, and so does Roger Cleveland. and whoever else is out there, that they want you to buy their gap wedge, which in the long run, like I said, is going to be a lot less forgiving, and you're not going to be able to hit at least a, a full swing as far. But, you know, that goes into the, the, the strategy of how, how often you want to make full swings with wedges. Exactly. That's what we talked about earlier today, that I said I would look at this gap wedge number. I'm going to get a real wedge, and I'm not going to hit it hard. I'm I'm already beginning to separate. For instance, I take my golf clubs, and from six iron on up, 
which means my anything I have above that, whether it be hybrids, woods, driver, whatever, that's one set of clubs. From this six iron down to this A wedge, that's another set of clubs. And then the three wedges I'm going to choose here, because I almost don't consider that one a wedge. A pitching wedge I don't really consider as a wedge. Um, that's another set of clubs. Because they have different purposes. These are to get the ball as close to the hole as possible. This is to save my tail because I'm in trouble. And this is just to move the ball around the golf course and, and not hit it in the crap. And get it, get it, move it as far as I possibly can without hitting it in the water in this sand or somebody's yard or something. So I break the set up in three. That was exciting. Everybody's applauding now. Okay, so here we go. Let's go to the wedges. And here's Callaway. Now, yeah, first I'm going to show you the wedge not to buy. And I'll tell you why. Generally, you're going to want to bend the lie angles on these golf clubs to get a wedge just the way to, because the lie angle on a, on a wedge is absolutely mandatory. I mean, if, you, if you're off at all with a wedge, that ball's going to go offline, even two degrees off at lie angle, go plenty offline. Not like a four iron, a four iron won't go off very much at all. So when you go to bend the club because of the smoked or the dark color, you'll see these spider marks all over here. So you'll think you just broke your golf club when you when you bend it. You didn't. Is that the chrome golf club also has the spider marks, but you just can't see them. Oh, I'd stay away from that. Callaway's was going to kill us already. Let me see. Where's the, what, what, oh, look what I did. I like this Phil Mickelson grind. Why? Because I think that everything, success or failure in short game is ball speed, ball speed, ball speed, ball speed, and the trajectory of the ball. And the golf ball is going to come off the face from here at a given speed. If your ball is sitting up, and, a lot, and I see this all the time, you see people where they got a ball sitting up in tall grass, and they hit it, they chip it, and they get halfway there. It's because it landed, it hit this part of the golf club. It's not going to come off the ball and face as, as, as quickly. And then I use the toe a lot, where I'll open the face and use the toe of the golf club. To, one, I'm opening the face to elevate the golf ball, but I'm also trying to take some, some speed out of it. I'm trying to control the speed. And this Phil club here has... Groove. Not that I know, not that I think the grooves really have anything to do with it, but at least it's consistent. At least it's the same surface all the way around here. So I can feel more confident about using the toe and, and having the same type of surface. But I'm not going to get the same ball speed. This is going to go slow. That's going to go faster. That's going to go slow. That's going to go slow. Just like a regular golf club. So, and, and let me, here's the question for you, Bobby. If you're taking more weight, because a, a sand wedge has only got a certain amount of weight. What is it, about 300 grams, 320 grams, something like that? Yeah. And you're moving it more into the hosel. What is that going to tell you about how forgiving the wedge is out on the toe or or towards the top of the club? Or what is it going to tell you about that? Well, I think I think you said it right this afternoon in the earlier session where you said that there's a lot more forgiveness, and I hate that word, but anyway, uh, with the, you know, that the golf clubs, the wedges have not caught up to the regular set as far as having the offset and having the, of course you don't want offset around the green, I don't think, but anyway, but having the lower center of gravity and, you know, and having a faster face on it. That that was my complaint with, with Ping. When I first got Ping, I was on Ping staff when I played on the tour and, and Carson gave me like six sets of clubs and I couldn't hit any of them because I couldn't chip with them because the ball would come off the face so fast. It wasn't like out in the fairway, you could hit a six iron and you could kill it. it you bombed it. But when you chip the, exactly. the ball to get, bounce off the face, it, take off, I'd right. blow it across the green. It was a cavity back. And what do you think this PM design is? It's a ping wedge. That's all it is. It's the same wedge as a ping. Well, the how come it doesn't go ping? <laughs> you know, it's better just to go ping. They actually did go ping. That's how I got the name ping. When it's first putters, you hit it and we go ping. But what other noises do you hear in your brain? Not many. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have a ping putter. It does go ping. You see? It I told you. Ranking. 
The, the old ones used to go ping. Yeah. So then this is a configuration. Now the other part of the configuration you have to be very careful with is sole of the golf club. Look at how the grind here, what they call the grind. How did I get this to go down some? There we go. See this? That's a lot different. Go ahead. Right, so that's what you call an M type of grind somewhere in there. There's so many different grinds. There's so many different um, letters that, that, that come with the grinds. But like with a basic M grind, you have a little bit of forgiveness on the heel and toe, a little bit of shave there, which allows you to open and close the face as needed. But um, to me, the grind, a lot of it is how big the flange is, how much bounce is in there, because I'm a big fan of insurance. And that's really what the grind and the bounce of a golf club are. It's, it's how much insurance you want to pay for. You can I think the average person needs a lot of insurance. You can see this sole configuration is different. Yep. It's simpler, it doesn't have that, that secondary grind there. See? Now what Darren's saying, which is so true, the average golfer needs more bounce. So we go over here and we look at specs on this, how rounded that sole is. I go in the opposite direction. I want less bounce, but I'm used to it. Even lower than what there was at one time, Callaway used to make a zero bound. Why I ever got rid of it, I don't know. I used to have one. Um, but you've got the different grinds, S grind, C grind, wide grind. And you'll see here you got 56 degrees. If you got 56 degrees, you're probably thinking sandwich. So you're going to want the 12 degree bounce if you want to be in the sand. You want more bounce in the sand. I want less bounce on that flop shot with the 58 degree. I'm surprised they don't and have a lot of, Yeah, well, a lot of it has to do too with where you're playing in the conditions. On, on a firmer golf course, you, you definitely don't want as much bounce. But I think in general, um, you know, good players are going to have a couple different wedges that they, um, they're going to carry around with them to the different courses. But for the average person, they need a ton of bounce. They need a big flange on the back, anything to help them, uh, to prevent them from digging. Well, if I go back over here and I'm going to pick myself out a wedge, here I am. I'm going to go with the Phil Mickelson. And I would go, if I look at the specs here, I know I had 46 degrees on my yeah, – look at, look at the Phil Mickelson. They don't make as many configurations. And look at the bounce on those. Now, I'm very surprised to see that. So I'd have to go with 54 from 46. So I'd have to almost side with Darren and say, maybe I should keep the 51 from the set and go 56, 60. Yep. Maybe even carry yep. 64. But I'd, I'd want to have this bounce to be down to at least four, or four or six at the most. Um, the 56, I don't mind because it's going to, you know, I want to use it in the sand a lot. But if I'm. So let's, de it, let's define that bounce a little bit and, and what 14 and 12 and 10 mean. The it basically means right. is, is when you set the golf club down on the ground and pretending it's just sitting on the shelf in a store, um, if it, the handle of the golf club is sitting right in line with the leading edge, that's going to be the amount of bounce you have. Now, when you move the handle forward, you move the handle back, you change the amount of bounce. So if you move the handle forward 14 degrees, you get to zero bounce on the golf club. You move it backwards a little bit you go from 14 to let's say four more degrees there's 18 degrees of bounce and that's the insurance policy that i'm talking about the more you lead your hands forward the more bounce you need and that's where most people get in trouble i think that they get the hands too far forward and the club digs too much it goes back to that webinar we had with derek sanders where we asked him what's the biggest thing amateurs um the mistakes they make when when he's out there on tour it's they don't know how to use the bounce because they put their hands ahead. They put the ball back. They put the weight forward. It's killing them. They try to trap it. And yep. you, you look here, here's the bounce. See low bounce, standard bounce, high bounce. You get you, when you get high bounce, which is what you want in a sand uh, sand trap, uh, you, you get the trailing edges hitting the ground first, not the leading edge. And like Darren will tell you, you should be using yeah. more of the trailing edge anyway because people use the leading edge too much. 
The only time you're going to get in trouble when you use the trail edge too much is if you're on hard pan or a car path. That's it. And very rarely are you going to do that. So if that's the case, you just got to lean the handle forward and then you'll start using the leading edge. But again, if you're using the leading edge the same way I use very low bounce, if you hit anywhere behind the ball very much, you're in trouble. Where using the trailing edge, you can hit you can hit the grass first before you hit the ball and you'll be all right. The, the bottom line is, is if you have good technique, you don't need any bounce. Right? You have, you need zero bounce if you have good technique. But the problem is people don't have good technique, so they need lots of bounce. They do. It's that simple. All right, so let's see, what else can we show them before we open it up to questions? One of the things we didn't talk about earlier was the loft and how fast the ball moves off the club face. And um, with my research and experience, I find that at 55 degrees, if, if the club is returning to the golf ball now, mind you, at the hit, the club is returning to the ball at about 55 degrees, you can start to create a relationship of what we call a smash factor of one, meaning how fast the golf club is moving. Let's say the golf club is moving at 20 miles an hour. You can get the ball to move at 20 miles an hour, and then you can get the ball to go 20 yards. And, um, you know, to me, that's a really magic number. Right about 55 in there. You can take take or give a degree on either side, but it's, it's really easy to come up with a strategy to hit some shots around the green if you can just swing your golf club at 20 miles an hour and get it to go 20, uh, 20 yards. You know what I'm going to get you? I'm going to get you some of those round glasses at a big whiteboard. <laughs> point deck to, and let you draw in there like, like you were a professor at Harvard or something. Uh, you know what, Bobby? You know nowadays it's why why me why guess when you can measure? You're right. That's my point. It's, you know, there's this a different world. It's a different world. And you're absolutely right. I mean, is if you can measure it, why not? And then how to how to get that across to somebody too, which so that they they understand to just swing that club yeah. at a tempo and a rhythm, the same speed you want the ball to come off the face. I feel that way with a long putt. I try to swing the club, the tempo that I want the ball speed to be. But but don't get me wrong, you know, I played up played uh, golf growing up at Yale, right? And at Yale, we didn't have any rakes and bunkers, and there were no yardages when I first started playing there. None. Can you imagine that nowadays? Wow. It's a completely different ball game. Let's see if we can get some comments here from the peanut gallery. Who's got some questions? Can we make sure Sarah's microphone's muted? <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Let it talk to you that way. Bobby, I have a 56 degree <laughs> bogey. I got, I got a 56 <laughs> degree bogey. Hold on, hold on. Who's, who's, who's that talking? Oh, that's Arby? Hold on, I'll open up your mic. Where are you? Oh, that's Ruthie. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I have, last year I bought the, a new Vokey wedge, a 56 right. for the bunker, and I bought a 50, and I think maybe I should bump that up to 52. To, to, you know, and I think my wedge, my Titleist wedge, is 45. I know. You know, I, I didn't. That's you know, out of the uh, you know, stock 45. No, I understand. Uh, AP2. Uh, Isn't it 45? Yes, because no, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll turn the mic back on, Bob. Just hanging there. Uh, understand one thing: when you take that 50 degree wedge, you have, I think you said 50, 52 or something. And you and you try and increase it by two degrees more loft. You change the bounce on the golf club. Right. You add bounce because the trailing edge is going to get become more predominant. If you do the reverse and you de-loft the golf club, now you're taking the trailing edge and you keep getting it stuck. If you hit anywhere between the ball, it gets stuck in the ground. So or maybe I should just leave it and then work. I'm thinking about well, distance control. Like, go more how far do I hit? No, you got you, Ruth. You got you. You got to get. You've got to get um, a, a gap wedge for that set. Now, th what I mean by gap wedge for that set is an AP two gap wedge, not a Volky wedge, not a Cleveland, an AP two that matches the set, which will get you to 50 degrees. The Titleist uh, pitching wedges are at 45 degrees. I, I That's taught, what I thought. I, I taught and sold, and I was certified with Titleist for over 10 years, so I know all their lofts pretty well, but that's what you have to get. You've got to get the AP2 and not a Vokey 
and then you can go from there. Okay. Okay. So I need another. I need another wedge. <laughs> yes. Yes. Don't feel bad. I need another brain. Anyway, hold on. We got some good. Yeah. We got some good. Well, maybe I'll get a left-handed wedge just to make a difference. Just in case. The generation two PXG woods are great. Fitting is the key. Okay. Well, that might be true. Maybe it's the generation two is better. Um, can I ask questions? No, Mike. Bob Sarris. <laughs> I have a question. I'll turn it on. Oh, go ahead. All right. What do you all think of um, lighter shafts for wedges? Um, as an example, the wedges I have have steel shafts. They're stiff as well. I won't. I won't go there. But anyway, um, they're very stiff. And I'm a old guy, and I have a slow swing speed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I've been reading some stuff about lighter or should I say closer to the shafts I have in my irons um, flex for wedges. So Linwood, um, you know, a wedge is a versatile golf club. So it's not like you're gonna be swinging it at full speed every single time, okay? So you can back off the weight, you can back off the flex a little bit for some of those in-between shots you have to hit. Uh, a good good, good example would be my lob wedge. My lob wedge is the length of my eight iron, right? Because sometimes I might need to hit this super high shot around the greens where I need more speed. And by adding length to the golf club, I can create more speed. So there's lots of different versatile shots you can have in there. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a shaft that matches the rest of the set. And when it, when it came to like Jack's club, Nicholas's clubs, he had a wedge that was a heck of a lot um looser than the rest of the golf clubs because he wasn't always swinging it at, at full speed so a little bit a little more flex in there give you a little bit more feel um so there's nothing wrong with that okay thanks um sand wedge as an example um they what i read even suggested that to not be a stiff shaft again because i'm an old guy yeah. And it's, it's nothing to do with you being old. Like Bobby was saying earlier today that um, you, it, you really shouldn't be hitting wedges at full speed. You know, most wedges you're going to hit are at partial speeds or re really low speeds. So why wouldn't you want a wedge with a little bit more flex? If, if you, you take the wedge out of your bat bag a hundred times, how many times are you going to swing it at full speed? Maybe five, maybe 10 at the most. Yeah. So you want the wedge, the flex of the wedge to, to match the majority of the shots you're trying to hit, which is not going to be full speed. I get okay, so though the lighter flex shaft is a good idea. There you go, great idea. There you go. Thank you. See, one of the drills Bill Melhorn used to make me do is I'd have to get out my wedge and hit it 100 yards to the 100 yard sign. Then I had to get my eight iron out and hit it to the 100 yard sign. Then exactly, that's a great, yeah, yep, it's great. Then my four iron, then my two iron, then my, we didn't have hybrids back then. Then my three wood and then my driver. I had to hit the driver 100 yards, no further. And you had to slow your swing down each time and change the tempo yep. to match. So here's a good question right here. It says, which bounce loft combinations would you recommend for those of us who play a variety of conditions, softer, firm, turf, bad lives, thick, rough, uneven bunkers? Thanks, Jack Nicholas. So oh, thanks. thanks for listening in there, Jack. I didn't know. Money can suggest to tune in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, this is this, this will this will kill you. Uh, Sowers, when I was working with him, almost every week he would change wedges. After the practice round, you know, because if he's playing in Georgia and he's got that Georgia red clay, he's going to have a certain bounce. If he's playing in Philadelphia and he's got a different, you know, situation, different bounce, different time of the year, same golf course, playing it three months later, the grass is different. So he would, he, you know, he would just add a, 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 a van, not a van, a, a trailer where they do repairs and everything. And he had all his wedge heads in there from Titus. He used the Vokey wedge. And he would go in the guy and say, okay, take my wedge heads off and take the same shaft he's got. Say, put these two heads on. And he would change every week. Now, the regular guy can't do that. You can't, you know, walk into the golf store and buy another wedge every, every week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a different golf course with my pals. So I would say, you know, a standard grind is... I don't know. What do you think, Darren? I wouldn't. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm saying highest highest amount of bounce and the biggest flange you can get, 
All right, so it'd be um, the W grind with the highest amount of bounce. Yeah, some kind of, or a K grind. You know, th there's some really good big flanges out there uh, and some really big bounces. So th that's where I would I would say, you know, it's to me, for the average golfer, it's more about the insurance policy that they're taking out. Okay, that's, um, and let's, let's get, uh, you just answered Bob's question, but let's get him on here. Hold on. Where did he go? There, where, 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 where is he? Where did he go? Where did he go? Come on, Sarah. So where are you here? Here he is. Oh, for Pete's sakes. Here it is. All right, Bob, can you can you, you get your microphone on? So he doesn't have a mic tonight. So he's he's typing oh, it in. Mic? You're kidding. Nope. You're kidding. <laughs> I paid Marcy to um to, to hide the mic for the night. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a question? I I I I'd, I'd like to ask you a question, Bobby, about when you were playing a lot on tour, did you have a practice wedge or two that you used and uh wedges that you used in tournaments or how did that work out? What did you do? I had three wedge. I had a 60 degree wedge before people thought of having a 60 degree wedge. It was Chico made it. But did, did, what, did you practice with a certain wedge or did you practice with the wedge you used in tournaments is my question. No, I played, I, I had three wedges and those were the three I had. That was it. And how long did you replace those? What, what was the time period? And I had them. Um, Once I, a month, three months, a year. Chico made them for me when I was around 19. And you figure I was 22 when I got to Spain, 24 all the way till, till at least 76. So I figure, figure I had it from 19 till I was 26 years old. Do you use the same wedges all that time? Same wedges. Wow. You should see Manolo Pinheiro. He did the same. He had he had one wedge, and that's all he used. Wow. Wow. So D Darren, right. so Darren, this is Albie again with the AP2s. So I have a 45 degree um, wedge, pitching wedge. So should I buy an A wedge that's 49 or 50 and then move you know, my 50? Yep. Either one of those fines, 49 or 50, and then you got the 52 next, right? I, well, I'd have to move it up to 52. It's, it's 50 and I got a 56, but I only have 13 clubs. At, at the, so I have room for another club. It's a Vokey 50, it's, right? It's, it's a Vokey 50. Exactly. That's where you can you can get that bent a little bit, you know, to maybe 53, and then um, th that would fall in there nicely. But my, my point with that is, is that the AP2 gap wedge is going to go, let's say the AP2 gap wedge is 50, and your Vokey degree uh, is 50. You're going to hit yeah. that Vokey degree is 10 yards shorter every single time, even though the same amount of loft, and you probably have the same shaft in there. You're going to hit it way shorter every time because of where how the hosel is designed. There, there's a lot right. less mass yeah. lots on of, the club face. Lots of times the shaft is stiffer too because they put S300s in a lot of those wedges. I don't know why. I, yeah, I think I have an S300 in my wedge in my Vokies. Yeah, but I have graphite in my irons. Then you so should, that A wedge should be a steel shaft or or a graphite. I would match it up with whatever you have. That's 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 what I that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. like I got a senior graphite. Yeah, yeah. just match it all up. Yeah, the way the way Derek the, looks at it, you have to have the same shaft. Yeah, you, you want the, the swing weights. The, to, you want the swing weights to be similar. And when I was at the Bears Club, uh, I ran into a guy named Chris Dempsey who was really hot when it came to club fitting. And one of his premises was to have the nine iron pitching wedge, gap wedge, sand wedge, lob wedge, all the same. Right, same length, same lofts, all the same. Where, you know, typically with with designs in there, you don't have that. They're not the same. They're they're different um, lengths and they're different lie angles. And but that's what I would say. Keep it all simple. Keep it all the same. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Now we'll call it a night. This was pretty good tonight. I got Very one. Good. Go ahead. I got one. Does all that bounce? Doesn't it make it hard to do your specialty shots when you get up near the green? 
Well, there's, there's always a trade-off. You know, if, you, if the club can do X, then you got to ask, well, what is it that it can't do? So if you're going to have more bounce on the golf club, if you're on tight, tight, you know, hard pan, you, you, you're going to have to lean, you know, put a lot of shaft leaning. You're going to put the, the, the grip way ahead of the head and try and pinch it. That's your only chance because you'll never get that bounce underneath the ball on hard pan. Right, and you're chipping runs and all that. Can you still do that with 14 degrees? What, what happens if you're right near the edge of the green? You know, if you're short side of the green and you got very little landing area, you got very little, um, you know, then then you're you're in trouble. But hey, you know, you can't have everything. I mean, right. No, what I mean. You know, the way Nicholas would describe it is just use the golf club the way it's designed. And if you look at some of the theories that Phil Mickelson has by putting the ball all the way back and putting the ball all the way forward, you're not using the club the way it's designed. You're manipulating it. Yeah, right. If you can put that club in the middle of your body, right in the middle of your stance, and use different golf clubs, um, you, you should be okay there. But when you start to put it in different areas and yeah, I guess you got to move it a little back when when things get a little hairy. But um, try to keep it as as um, as the way the club is designed as much as possible. That's where we, you know, you notice around the greens when we do a short game thing, and I talk about chipping with an eight iron, then a six iron, then a wedge, and then you know using the right club. Where Billy Casper would chip with a wet sand wedge, but he would manipulate that sand wedge. You know, you had to have the hands of a of an actual safe cracker you know you had to really have feel and and you had to manipulate the golf club and and i just that's for the average golfer that's not easy to do i'd rather just make a just a standard back and forth stroke and just keep swapping clubs and learn how to learn how to picture the landing area and know about how fast that is and decide which which spinal off i'm going to need whether it's an eight iron nine iron seven iron six iron what have you same stroke every time just swap swap clubs you know, everybody says Seve was so great, Bobby, because, you know, he grew up with just a three iron and he found it in a dumpster and he learned to hit all these different shots with a hey, three iron. But, crap. But you know what? The modern day player, they're not doing that stuff. They're using it the way the club is designed. They, they don't need to. But players in your generation, you never had a 60 degree. You know, sand wedge was a, a luxury, you know, when, when you were playing on tour. You know, so the, the modern day player doesn't have to worry about that stuff. They don't have to manipulate it and, and use it in different ways so they can interact with the ground the right way. Well, Chico was making wedges before anybody was, you know. He, 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 in fact, he sold his wedge configuration to a company called Northwestern. Remember them? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Too late. Okay. All right, any other questions? If not, we'll call, call it a night. With a high note. We, um, make sure you take a look at the website. We're looking for uh, doing a lot of online live lessons, so make sure you're doing Hold on a second. We got some notes going on here. We did our best though. There it is. Yeah, in fact, we we did a couple today. We're getting the kinks out. Anybody who's interested in doing a lesson, absolutely free live, where just like we're doing now, you'll be able to ask questions while we're doing the analysis and it makes a big difference i think and that might be the direction we're going in and uh oh tom willis here thomas how nice it is to have you with us just notice that we've yeah we had a good uh, turnout tonight and i would encourage everyone to just shoot this link to a friend i mean you're enjoying it that's why you tune in so why wouldn't you want your friends enjoying it so um the integrity of these uh webinars is uh dependent on you so uh, shoot out, shoot that out to a friend, and um, and send those videos in. Yep, you got it. And we'll send. Uh, let me see. But well, what a great idea! Live lesson. Yes, yes. That's what we're doing. We did a couple today, and they, and they, the guys loved it. Thought it was really great. In fact, hold on. I think one of them. There you go. Hold it, Kim. You got a microphone? I guess he doesn't have a microphone in his set up there. He was one of them that did it, and, and, and we had, I think, some really good feedback. We learned a lot as well as they did, so we're, we're learning as you go along. So that's why we're not charging anything for it right now, because there's going to be some hiccups. 
but we'll, we'll get through it. All right. Hope you enjoyed it, gang. Good. Have a great night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.